Hi, I'm Ben from Blue Sky Online School in Minnesota. Uh, I like to say I'm the IT guy there. We also have... Hi, I'm Brenda Ritter. I'm an instructional designer at Blue Sky. I've held many roles in <laughs> Moodle and at the school from math teacher to where I am now. Yeah, I'm Dan Nottage. I am the principal at Blue Sky. Um, so we're going to cover quite a few things here. Uh, we've done this presentation before and it took 50 minutes, but <laughs> I think we've cut it back. So get ready for a ride. A um, little bit about Blue Sky. Um, we were Minnesota's first 100% online public school, public charter school. We have been around 24, going on 25 years um, next spring. Uh, we serve students in grades six through 12. Um, currently we have 625 full-time students, about 140 part-time students. We do serve some students in other states across the United States and a small number of students internationally through our tuition program. 70% of our students are at risk for not graduating. They meet one of 13 criteria, um, to one or more criteria demonstrating that they uh, have some kind of barrier to graduation. And so we work really hard to make sure our students have the skills and knowledge to meet all the graduation requirements for the state of Minnesota. Uh, we have two types of classes at Blue Sky. We have synchronous classes and asynchronous classes. Um, so both of those options uh, really serve the broad needs of our students. Um, currently we have 91 staff and uh, have a district office located right across the Mall of America. So if you're ever at the Mall of America, come by and uh, see us. Uh I think I'll use this one because, you know, I gotta see what I'm looking at. I just wanted to cover some key vocabulary in case you aren't familiar with these things yet. Uh, Moodle competencies, which I mean, may, probably many of you are, no, understand, use Moodle competencies. Well, you could see some hands. At least you're awake, some of you. Because, um, you know, after lunch, that like time for a nap. <laughs> but basically, competencies in Moodle, that's a framework of skills and knowledge that can be, like, you can put them into Moodle. So the image you see here is a list of some of our competency frameworks. We have many at our school, and we'll get into that later. Um, the taxonomies, that's just the levels that can be assigned to those competencies in there, because if you've worked with competencies, most of you probably have. You know there can be many complicated, many levels, many systems. That's just those, those frameworks. Um, we're going to talk about standards. That, that's a, what we use. It's kind of like a competency, but basically it's just a general statement of what a student should know and be able to do. Um, and like I said, that's just compared to that competency level. And then underneath the standard or with standards, we have benchmarks as well. And so you'll hear us talk about that too. That's just a different you know, kind of level of that framework, that specific objective or learning target. Um, oh, I did, I, did, I did my work. It could be you know, an outcome or a skill in that competency framework. And this image here is just a, one of our specific ones. So um, one of the big questions was, why did we move to Moodle competencies? Um, the big thing for us was state reporting. Um, in Minnesota, because we're serving students across state that are um, attending other schools across our state, it's really important that we can show that they're learning the exact same skills and knowledge that they'd be learning in any school across the state. Um, so as an online provider in our state, we are required to submit reporting to show that we are covering all those standards. Um, occasionally schools will ask um, for records to prove that a child that's transferring their credits over into their school, those credits are meeting certain requirements. So um, quite often we are asked to kind of prove this information and um, with Moodle competencies, it, it just puts it all in one place. Another um, reason we moved is, uh, if you're familiar, in like, especially in the K-12 world, um, with um, curriculum mapping, and there's a lot of different tools and um, software out there that, that does that. 
But in many of the cases, it's very external. It's not connected with the actual curriculum. And um, so basically what was happening is we would create a curriculum map. We'd tell teachers, hey, <laughs> use this, this curriculum, cover these standards. And the teachers would get it and change it or teach whatever they wanted to teach. And it wasn't being updated or maintained, so it's hard to actually prove we were teaching those skills and knowledge, those competencies. Um, so basically for us, our goal was getting those competencies or standards into the system our teachers were actually using. Um, and the, one of the nice things with competencies is you can assign them um, at the assignment level. So it's, you can really drill down to exactly where a student is learning something. And that can be really handy on the flip side when you're trying to figure out um, the strengths and the weaknesses of your curriculum. Done with that? Yeah. All right. So adding those Moodle competency frameworks, I know I kind of showed you a brief glimpse of those different, um, that list we had of a lot of them. This is probably the hardest part when getting started is getting these frameworks added. Because um, we had to take and convert all those local, state, national. It's not like one consistent system. The math to the language arts to the social studies, they all have a little bit different format. They all have a little bit different system. You guys are probably dealing with different competencies coming in and out or different you know, ways to list those. So we had to figure out how to do that. Um, and at our school, it was a really big learning process because some of them get manually uploaded. We have another instructional designer and she manually uploaded them. Um, some get bulk uploaded after manipulating a file. That's what I did because I'd rather work in a Excel spreadsheet file than manually typing everything out or copying and pasting it. Um, and then we learned that when we kind of drilled down to those different levels below, we were finding at the very beginning that there, we used like those numbering systems. If we weren't careful, we ended up with duplicate numbers, duplicate like tags in there, and you can't have that. So we had to re get really creative on, and make sure we were aware of that naming system. So if you're kind of looking into that, something to watch out for. So a big question was, how are we going about doing this? Um, if you have looked at this before or are doing it, you probably know there are a lot of questions to answer in terms of how you actually roll using competencies out for, for all of your staff. Um, so we decided, um, knowing that there was a bunch of levels and taxonomies through trial and error, we had our staff try several different things, we decided to only assign at the benchmark level, the lowest level of the competency. Um, but within the system, you can actually assign at all the different levels. We just found that was too complicated for our staff. Um, so that was one big decision we had to make kind of up front. So know that if, if you move forward with competencies. Um, and then we also decided that teachers should be assigning it only where they're summatively assessing that competency or that standard. Um, when we didn't do that, we found that there were just way too many and it was actually hard to drill down and say, this is really where we're covering this competency or this um, standard. And then um, we had to create a bunch of custom reports. We'll get into that in a little bit um, to help us identify where um, we were covering things and kind of get that broader curriculum map that we were looking for. So uh, a little bit with the challenges, um, and, and hopefully if you do this, you can learn from some of our, our mistakes along the way. Um, competency standards, or if you have learning targets, whatever your organization might have, they may have different hierarchies. Um, for us, some standards have strands and substrands, and then a benchmark. Uh, some only go standards and benchmarks. So there was, they were all organized in very different ways. So that was part of the challenge when we were importing them is we couldn't just put them in one way. <laughs> so it took a lot of time and energy to, to figure out just how to get um, the competencies into the system. But I think that wasn't that big of a challenge. So don't let that deter you. Um, competency reporting is live 
in the system. So if a teacher makes a change, they remove an assignment or a resource that has a competency attached to it, it's going to change. And so when we were trying to do some of our state reporting in the summer when our teachers and staff were working, sometimes we found there were holes in our curriculum and we actually couldn't provide the documentation to the state. So we had, um, had to come up with some different workarounds on how we were um, tracking those competencies. Um, and then um, we didn't have all of the tools that our curriculum alignment and curriculum mapping software had. So we had to recreate some of the documentation for that. Um, in our school, we have a pretty rigorous process for um, developing and reviewing our curriculum. And so when we lost some of that capability, we had to kind of recreate some of that um, because Moodle competencies really just did that competency piece and not the broader curriculum planning um, that we needed. On the positive side, um, it created a really direct connection for our teachers. They really felt connected to the standards, the, the content that our state or our school district said that they should be teaching our students. And um, if any of you use a backward design model, this really helped facilitate a backward design design model for our curriculum. Um, basically, teachers, if they created a lesson, they couldn't attach a competency, what was the point? And so they learned very quickly that they always had to attach a competency or it probably wasn't something needed in their course or something they could be adding into another assignment or activity. Um, consistent implementation, I, I think, was Another really high, the light, big highlight for us because it was super easy. Once, um, in our case, we loaded those the competencies in, but in um, other settings, you can choose to let your, your staff load them in. But once they were loaded in, all they had to do is go into their assignment, go to a drop-down menu, and select the competency, or if they, had, they can have more than one competency, and they just select it with the drop-down menu. So it's super simple to do. And it was live, so even though that was kind of a negative, one of the positives is it's live. It updates immediately. When a teacher updates or fixes an assignment, it was there for the world to see. Um, so it was really easy to integrate, uh, and it was really easy to identify the gaps in our curriculum. And so we were able to quickly make some changes and updates um, that we couldn't see before with our old system. So now I'll take you through some of the different views uh, that staff looked at with mapping. This was one of the teacher views that they would see when they were adding competencies, or in our case, academic standards, we put them in competencies in their class. But because we needed custom reporting to, to fill in the blanks of some of the different pieces and to get more administrative level reporting that we didn't find in core Moodle, I created some different custom reports that I've shared in ad hoc reports in middle.org so that we could figure out which academic standards were used in which courses. And administrators could see that as well as teachers finding where the alignment gaps were in their courses. So I developed this as a, a drill down, as I kind of like to say it with different ad hoc reporting I've created, where at an administrative level, an admin team member like our principal, Dan, could go in and choose a department and say, I want to look at the math team and see what standards are being aligned with math standards. From there, it'll bring you to another level of reporting where you can see what standards are being used. And you can see, for instance, the third row from the top is not being used. And then other was that a duplicate slide? Oh, and then, thank you, Brenda. And then, uh, in line with drill down reporting, so that when you click on that linked number in the previous slide, it would actually bring you to which uh, standards were being addressed in that course for that standard, so that you could see how exactly 
those nine iterances or instances of that standard were being used. And I want to iterate that or this particular set of reporting versus the first one we showed was just for the teacher. This one is for the whole course wide. So this standard you can see across your whole however many courses are in that Moodle instance, you can see where it's covered in multiple courses. So this kind of gap analysis helped us to fill in some of those blanks. Like Dan talked about how we're able to see live views. Then we could, before we need to submit any kind of reporting to state, we can see what gap analysis do we need to do? Where do we need to fill in those holes where maybe there aren't being some standards addressed that we need to be? And along the lines of custom reporting, these are some of the, the reasons that we've already mentioned. We've kind of already covered these well, uh, especially Dan uh, mentioned this a few different times. You can keep going. And as I mentioned before, with the, the drill down kind of level of reporting where you can start at a department level and then move on to a specific standard or strand, so that you can get down even to that course level where I don't think we showed a slide of this, but we have other uh, custom reporting so that a teacher can go into their course and see just exactly what standards they are or aren't addressing I for all of the different. it's in there if you look at it afterwards, it's one of the views. Right on. This is a link uh, if uh, the slide deck could share it out. Um, Next I don't have time we'll learn to make a QR code. Thanks for all of you for showing me things. <laughs> Yes, um, we'll get this shared out in some, some means, but you could find it there if you've been in ad hoc reports at Moodle.org and, and find that so that you could um, easily use similar uh, reporting like we were just using. Great, so I just kind of want to touch a little bit on teaching using competencies from that teacher side of things. Um, you know, the why. So by aligning our courses to the standards in Moodle, and we've talked about this you know, a little bit, but we're able to analyze and communicate what our students are learning in each course. It makes it really transparent, really clear, um, which leads us from saying, instead of what will we teach in the curriculum, which is the focus on the content, um, it, it really brings that curriculum question to what should the students be able to do with their learning? And it puts that focus back on the students. So that's where we were going with this. And then again, like we've we've said, it just clearly shows where they're, where those standards are strongly covered. It allows us to have that accountability, that analysis, and really get into our curriculum and understand where, where our students are at. We've empowered our teachers to make those decisions on small and large scale. They can do it within an, a, an individual assignment. Hey, this assignment really isn't working. Well, here's, the, here's what we need to cover in this assignment, but let's recreate it using an H5P or using some other module of learning. So they're not writing an essay. Maybe they're creating some content in a, you know, a graphic designing software or something. And one real... One really big um, implementation we did with this, which was a, a learning curve and we learned a lot and we failed and we tried again. Um, it's okay, but we really, we're, we're a charter school, we said at the beginning, and so we strive to innovate in the classroom. In the 2019-2020 school year, we actually started a multi-year implementation of um, the social and emotional learning competencies. We use, it's called CASEL, um, which is Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And they had a, a set of social and emotional learning competencies built, so we used theirs. And so our goal was to integrate that, um, those social and emotional learning standards uh, as an academic progress indicator into our curriculum so we could use that for state reporting measures for our school. So we weren't just saying, hey, I can add two plus two, but I can, I can make a decision and I can enact in my community. And if you're not familiar with these, you probably are in some other, I'm sure, <laughs> some other form, if, even if it's not this castle form, the, those social and emotional learning. So I think one thing, if you go to the next slide, with this that was really huge is our school board said, do this. And it was all of these standards in every subject area. Teachers were a little bit worried and nervous about, how do I do this? It's not my subject area. It's something I'm not familiar with. And the tools using competencies in Moodle helped us, one, kind of administratively manage and monitor and see where is this happening? Where are we putting these in? Where aren't we putting them in? Ask questions why. 
Um, and so using that reporting and uh, having it right in the content helped us really figure out um, kind of our path forward. And we were able to really quickly, again, because it was live, we could quickly identify um, where we needed to maybe adapt and change our strategy to reach full implementation. Good. Next slide. So one of the things that has been a bit of a struggle uh, is not like we've spoken a lot about the implementation and some of the you know, pros and cons of using this and, and how we've really rallied the troops and uh, made good use of, of Moodle competencies in a general idea. I'm gonna take a step back, a little broader global view of what's going on with frameworks and Moodle competencies in, in general. If you haven't, how many of you raise your hand if you're uh, familiar with IMS Global? They made IMS Global compatible, of course, compatible format? Yeah, okay. They now want EdTech and they have something called CASE, which is universal format of frameworks so that it could be an interchangeable format to say, okay, here, you can have these frameworks for academic standards in Minnesota, go. Okay, well, what do I do with that now? What, where do I put them? Well, that format, kind of like Brenda talked about, like she had to manipulate an Excel file to make it do all the magic so that we could put it into Moodle, into frameworks. Well, not everything is talking to everything in the way we'd like it to. But, ta-da, one tech, one tech does have a universal format of academic standards we just need to work as a global community in with our DOE Department of Education with different LMS to interchange and adopt these different things. So that's a little bit about case. So, and this kind of goes to, to think about in a, another global perspective, it's not just academic standards that we wanna put in Moodle competencies. It could be some kind of frameworks for uh, a business. It could be for industry if you're in plumbing or welding. There's all kinds of business and educational and government standards that we want to share that we could put into Moodle competencies. So there are other places you can find competencies to load. If you want to go to, uh, I, it's now One Ed Tech. I keep wanting to say IMS Global, but it's One Ed Tech. Or if you go to MoodleNet, there's also another place that I have gone to very little, but another place that you could reach out to. These are all good places to find different frameworks for you to load in your Moodle competencies. And that's so you don't have to manipulate that spreadsheet. As <laughs> if, much. If it's there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One thing I would suggest you do, and hopefully that this is some more kind of like uh, talk around the Moodle town this week is that the MUA is an organization that we have, as Blue Sky, have participated in the past to help further development of some kind of universal frameworks adoption integration process. Well, uh, PAG could be another way to do that. I'd love to hear more uh, with different members of MUA and PAG just exactly how that's moving forward. But I do know that there is a place for putting those kinds of idea suggestions, like I've just shared. Um, so just some key takeaways that we thought we wanted to highlight, because you know it's a long day, it's a long week, and it's only day one. Um, but really it was that high staff buy-in, it's easy for teachers to use. It improved that reporting and curriculum analysis. Um, Moodle learning plans is there. Some of you maybe have used or are familiar with Moodle learning plans. We aren't there yet. Um, it doesn't, didn't quite fit in with how we were doing things, but it's there and it's, it's towards that competency-based learning style. Um, adding challenges can be, or adding competencies can be challenging. Nothing you can't overcome, but that's like Ben said, we wanna invoke the minds of all of us around here because the more we as a community are thinking about it, the more easily we come to solutions that makes sense, just like in our last presentation, not everything's perfect, but when we put, it, put our brains together, we come up with really great things. Um, we, did, we did find a, a bit of a disconnect between rating competencies, and I didn't touch on this when we were doing social emotional learning, um, but we had a, a struggle with our teachers rating those social emotional competencies and then actually grading them. Um, with how we, how we do because we aren't a competency-based learning. We still needed to assign a grade. 
Um, so that's another one of those areas that we could continue to work to build as a global community to, to seamlessly integrate those things. And that was perfect because we have five minutes for questions. The second. That's on now. It's on now? Okay. So in your last slide, you mentioned high instructor buy-in. How'd you get that? Like, is that just a K to 12 thing? Because from my perspective, change is hard to adopt. Yes, change is hard to adopt. And honestly, I have done change management training and so have all of our leadership. So if you've never, if you're in a leadership role, do first of all, do some change management training because <laughs> that will really help you in that process um, of making those changes. And, and we really, we walked them through it. Uh, I, I train my teachers, I love doing that, and they love doing it. We make sure we have really good guides for them so they have the resources, they can see it visually with images or just have steps, and then we provide training time during our professional development to help um, pull that together. And, and I think a big piece too is we have a leave nobody behind mentality. And so we're not huge, right? Um, but we used our leadership at department level at various levels to also make sure there was a really high level of support. And then was the, the monitoring actually helped with that. Uh, sometimes that can seem oppressive, but that was actually one way. We did it in a supportive way, not in a gotcha way. Hi, a uh, question, how this looks like on the student side? Because uh, you said uh, how you visualize the competencies for the students which they need to achieve in order to graduate and so on. That's a great question and something that, I, the way you framed it, we don't do it exactly like that, but the learning plans can show the competencies. So we aren't there yet with the learning plans. We instruct our teachers on the instructional design side to um, put forth uh, learning to, like learning targets, uh, I can statements for the students in their lessons. So they have a version of it, but it's probably not the benchmark language because that's usually a little more academic. Is that? I'll just add to, we did have a teacher, a couple staff try it. It was really clunky kind of connecting those two pieces, even though they're really similar and there's a lot of commonality. So just didn't work for us. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, you covered the assessment part of things, but in curriculum mapping tools, uh, we have often also a teaching methods part of the thing. So how do you think your system could accommodate uh, the teaching methods review uh, that are, because you want alignment between uh, assignments, teaching methods, and competencies. So. Yeah, and so a, a big part of that is we created our own documentation, um, creating like we call them teacher guides. And so we created documents to do backward design. All of our curriculum is done through an instructional designer like Brenda. Um, so there is other oversight that we have for the actual developmental process. Uh, maybe you wanna add to that? So, so. I have a question for the audience, if we have a minute left. Yeah, oh no. How are you using, how are you using competencies in your course sites? Does anybody ask that? <laughs> Mark in the back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate being here today. Thank you.